in this episode we are going to talk about paternalism and laissez-faireism as two important components in the imperial ideology in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Paternalism and laissez-faireism do not have identical meanings. These two are different concepts, but as we shall see at one level, they actually converge with one another. Basically, paternalism means a certain attitude towards Indians uh, being visualized as living in a state of eternal childhood. And laissez-faireism excludes the possibility of the kind of assertive intervention that you come across during the 1820s and 30s by the British civil servants in Indian social life. They wish to leave Indian society alone in order that they should not produce the kind of turbulence that India had seen during 1857. They began to work on the assumption that 1857 rebellion was a kind of an orthodox reaction against British social interventionism. And on this premise, they try to chart out a new policy of laissez-faire, meaning leaving Indian society alone. So this is the relationship between the two problems or the two components of this imperial ideology we are going to spell out in this discussion. To some extent, it is a continuation of what we had already stated in the earlier episode in which we talked about how utilitarianism inspired what is known as the civilizing mission. Now, what is this difference that we are talking about? Where is paternalism different from civilizing mission and where you have a certain convergence? The civilizers were also paternalists, as you can see, because they looked upon Indian society in a state of backwardness, and they believed that with British leadership, with British guardianship, this society will be enabled to become a new West, will be enabled to uh, emerge as a modern society. Yeah. So there was a certain commitment to India's transformation as a modern society. This commitment began to dissipate in the second half of the 19th century, when the paternalist dimension in civilizing mission, where the father figure was expected to play the role of the leader, the guardian. Now the father figure continues to lead, but not on the assumption of enabling the child to grow as a mature uh, citizen, but to keep the child in an eternal childhood because the child is unable to grow. So that is the kind of assumption in paternalist doc logic, which became firmly wedded to the idea of a certain permanent rule. The British were here to rule permanently because there was no possibility for Indians to emerge as a mature race, mature people, capable of managing institutions of self-government. Then what is the alternative to this? Some historians label the system that ruled India as one of bureaucratic despotism. Now this bureaucratic despotism, as we had suggested, was basically premised on the assumption that you need a despot. So what is this bureaucratic despotism all about? Can you elaborate on this? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, the idea that India had a despotic culture, it's an old idea. You have seen this figuring in James Mill, the idea of oriental despotism. So James Mill and others believed that the despotic culture which allowed rule or by discretionary methods needed to be replaced by a system of rule based on laws. Law should be codified, should be properly intelligible for the subjects. Scope for discretion should be minimum. So it will be a kind of a legal regime that James Mill and others actually visualized. And as a part of this particular attitude, as a part of this reformist program, 
you have seen introduction of Western institutions, institutions not merely in educational sphere, but in the sphere of legal justice as well. The new courts were set up. Of course, this system continued. But there was a, an equally strong opinion among a section of the civil servants, even during the 1820s, even in the early part of the 19th century. People like Mount Stuart Elphinstone, for example, John Malcolm, Charles Metcalf, those who were not very anxious, very keen to reform India, they felt that India should be ruled in the manner India had been ruled since ages. So the idea was that the British bureaucrats in India must practice this despotism in order to attune British administration in India with the political culture of this country. But there was an additional dimension as well, which is derived from utilitarianism. As you know, that utilitarianism had a long history of changes. The early utilitarian philosophy didn't believe in representative government. They believed that whatever governs the best is the best. They believed in the leadership of an educated, wise legislator who were expected to lead the illiterate people to the path of progress. So that was the Benthamite ideal that was later replaced through the English reform movement by a certain commitment that the utilitarians later began to evince for representative government. But that aspect of utilitarianism was never applied to India because they were working on the assumption that Indians still needed the British guardianship in order to qualify for that elevated status to be able to manage or to, uh, to, to handle institutions of self-government. Now, this particular approach that the more conservative officials of the early 19th century had, which diverged from utilitarian approach to governance, the conservatives believed that the Indian institutions required to be preserved. Indian institutions in agriculture, in rural areas, in matters of governance, in legal matters, all this needed to be preserved. This conservative mentality actually fed into what emerged as a Punjab's style of governance, the Punjab school of administration. Some people who didn't believe in the usefulness of these new judicial institutions that the British had set up, they believed in summary trials. This is the meaning of the Punjab school. Uh, sir, is the Punjab school of government any different from the other administrative policies that were formulated in India? Not really, but you have different schools of administration that had emerged in British India. For example, the Bengal school is associated with the name of Cornwallis, that you have a, well, a system governed by manuals and regulations. So these people are known as regulation officials, that whatever the government has to do has to be guided by certain well-codified rules, and these rules and regulations should be inscribed into manuals and this is something which was uh, followed by men like Macaulay and others when, who proposed the codification. But in contrast, you have a different kind of tradition in Madras, for example, where there was no settlement with the Zamidars. There was a direct relationship established by Munro, the architect of the Rayatwari system with the peasants. These officials who believed in this kind of direct relationship were willing to dispense with the various kinds of institutional regulations that often stood between the peasants and the rulers. Similar attitudes were displayed by the so-called Punjab school of administrators. Men like Henry Lawrence was a resident in Punjab, evincing a certain attitude towards government where rules and regulations didn't matter much. There should be a more direct relationship between the subject and the rulers. The rulers were white ruling class representing the British in the districts. The district officer is to play the role of the father figure of the district, protective, always going on tour on horseback, meeting the subjects more regularly and extending them the protective cover or the, the hands of protection that the ordinary people expected from the rulers. So if you have this kind of a relationship, which is basically despotic, but which is paternalistic, so bureaucratic despotism is premised on the idea that the British civil servants were to play the role of the protectors of the ordinary people of India, mainly peasants in the countryside. And this particular attitude 
often uh, found nothing valuable in the regulation. They found that a more direct relationship, which may lead to arbitrary decisions, which may lead to summary trials, summary punishments, summary judicial decisions taken at the spot, on the spot, by the man on the spot, the district officer. This, for them, was preferable to the kind of government by regulation that the Cornwall system in Bengal had established. So you have different types of attitudes among officials belonging to different regions, and that is the reason why we actually can distinguish in India different schools of administration. During the period after 1857, in a relatively conservative atmosphere, when the officials were actually looking upon the reformist initiative of the earlier decade as a kind of a risky business, because um, 1857 was interpreted as a kind of a reaction to the reformist intervention, in this kind of an atmosphere, bureaucratic despotism or the opinion of the Lawrence brothers became more acceptable or attained a level of popularity which they hadn't had in the era of reform. And the entire visualization or the vision of bureaucratic despotism was based on a series of myths about the glorified role or the elevated role uh, or the expected role of the civil servants in the Indian countryside. Now this civil service mythography, that the civil servants were closer to the people, the civil servants were more acceptable to the, to the people than the Indian politicians were. The civil servants had maintained a close intimacy with the ordinary Indians, something which even the Indian nationalists were not maintaining as they were mainly urban people, urban leaders. These myths were deliberately perpetrated through different kinds of literature. You will come across this propagation or the perpetuation of this myth in the civil service memoirs, for example. Many of these officials who had served in India would go back to England and then they would write their memoirs recounting their experience among the rural folks, telling us stories about how the rural folks looked upon them as father figures, as their protectors, as their mob up. So that is the idea of the mob up Raj that was very systematically and deliberately projected in many such stories which are incorporated in the memoirs of the civil servants. You have fictional literature, for example, which also contains the same stereotyped images of Indians living in an eternal state of childhood and the father figure of the district carrying out a paternalist government in the district. You have Kipling, for example, who is known as the poet of imperialism. You must be familiar with the famous poem, White Man's Burden, that you go out, I mean, Kipling was actually in this poem asking Englishmen to send their best people to India to rule a people who are half devil, half child. That is the very interesting expression, that Indians are children, but there is a devilish element in uh, such children. And in order to contain this devilish element in these children, what was needed was the Victorian rod of order, which these civil servants were expected to build. So the father is a punisher. The father is also a protector. If there is an errant child, the father has to punish the errant child with disciplinary measures. So if Indians are going astray, are becoming behaving seditiously, the road of order that the civil servants were expected to build in the countryside would fit in well with the paternalist attitudes of these civil servants. So Kipling is, is the storyteller, storyteller of imperialism. Uh, sir, like Kipling is called the storyteller of imperialism. Does his other stories also harp on this idea of paternalism? A number of them. I, I was mentioning White Man's Barden as an example because in this poem, the whole idea was succinctly uh, uh, argued. But then you have stories like, for example, Head of the District. It's a very interesting story of an Indian magistrate being appointed in a trouble-torn tribal district in the northwest India, the Indian magistrate, although fairly advanced in age, fails. And he returns. He cannot remain in the station. So he is replaced by a young English civilian who is a new recruit, who had just arrived in India. He goes there and he manages, he, he brings back order and stability. 
So what is this message? The message is that an Indian, however experienced he may be, is not qualified to hold the district. In his place, even a young civilian who doesn't have much experience in administration can manage things better. So you have similar such stories. The tomb of his ancestors, for example, recounts the tale of a person who is a descendant of an official who had served 100 years earlier. And this man returns as a young official who is worshipped by the local people as the reincarnation of that protector who had served them 100 years earlier. So such stories, or you have the bridge builders, for example, in which Kipling actually makes that famous statement that however much the British officials try to make India modern, create India, create modern India, however much the British officials coax and cajole Indians to good living, Indians will never change. Clipping stories, as you can understand, spelt out a theory of dependency. I mean, the whole notion of Indians being children and therefore needed the caring hands of the civil servants is a dependency argument. Now, this dependency argument, apart from the fictional literature, this dependency argument was expressed and articulated or exposed or more systematically spelled out in other kinds of literature as well. You have a more serious kind of philosophical writing by a pseudo uh, utilitarian philosopher. I have talked about Stephen in an earlier discussion, Stephen was a law member in the Viceroy's Council during the 1850s. Stephen wrote a book called Foundation of the Indian Government in which he talked about the need for a kind of an authoritarian regime in India, arguing that while in England the efficiency of the administrator was very systematically destroyed and subverted by democratization, India presented a healthy contrast in which the fine people among the civil servants were enabled to rule the country with great efficiency, with great wisdom, without being constantly harassed by the legislators or by political processes. You have a very interesting work on the same theme of dependency by a man called Charles Dilke. He was a journalist like Kipling. Dilke wrote a book called uh, The Greater Britain in 1869 which was a kind of a travelogue, covered the entire British Empire, went to the white settlements and also came to India. And this was the time when some public-spirited men in England were contemplating withdrawal from the colonies. Now this is in the 19th century, Richard Cobden was a protagonist of this theory that keeping empire was expensive and imperialism was actually eating into the moral fabric of British liberalism. So on such grounds, some people like Cobden had recommended withdrawal from the colonies, and Dilke, while engaging with this kind of a argument, suggested that withdrawal from the white settlement was feasible, because otherwise, with the white settlement's connections will continue to exist. But withdrawal from India was not possible, cannot be practiced, because India was a dependency. So the idea of dependency was very strongly embedded in the official mind. And this was supporting or this was reinforcing the paternalist logic. Slightly different was an assessment by a historian called Sir John Seeley, a very well-known historian who specialized in imperial history and held the chair of imperial history in the University of Cambridge. He wrote a book called The Expansion of England in 1883, in which Seeley tried to suggest that India's dependency arises not from any racial depraved, racial depravities or racial inadequacies among Indians. It was not as if that the Indians were racially inferior to the British, but Indians were very divided. They are divided along caste lines, along communal lines, and such divisions created potentialities for extreme disorder. If you think of a democratic order in India, there was every likelihood of different Indian social groups divided along such communitarian and caste lines would actually conflict in, with one another when it comes to framing policies. So in order to avoid that kind of eventuality,
what was important was the permanent presence of the British to maintain a neutral state, a neutral government. So different kinds of ideas, ideas expressed in different kinds of literature, uh, starting with the memoirs of the civil servants. You have fictional literature of the sort that Kipling had written. You have more serious kinds of writings that uh, you will find in Seeley or Dilke or Stephen. All of these writing from different angles were actually feeding into this paternalist belief that the presence of the British was so important to keep stability, to keep Indian society together, to maintain a neutral government which the Indians were incapable of, to maintain government which the Indians were incapable of, incapable of because of their perennial lack of maturity. The idea of an unchanging East ultimately becomes an argument in favor of paternalism, and that becomes wedded with an extremely conservative attitude towards Indian society, a conservative attitude which excludes the possibility of India's transition to modernity. And this attitude was defining the parameters of social policy in the later half of the century. For which reason, Metcalf, the famous historian Thomas Metcalf, who wrote on the ideologies of the empire, also wrote an earlier book called The Aftermath of the Revolt, in which he uses this term, a conservative reaction in British policy, which is, has a paternalist dimension, which has is, uh, which has a negative social policy dimension. Metcalf talks about the manner in which the British officials became extremely reluctant to intervene in Indian social customs. The only major intervention that took place after the mutiny was the age of consent bill in 1891, when the marriageable age of women was raised from 9 to 12. Accepting this, there was no major intervention. The kind of social policy initiative that you come across in the 1820s and 1830s in the era of reform was missing. So paternalism and the attitude and the more conservative attitude which actually excludes the possibility of a reformist initiative in India went hand in hand and thus latter actually feeds into what is known as conservative reaction in British policy premised on the assumption that the Indians were so change resistant that any intervention in Indian social matters was likely to provoke a very orthodox reaction disturbing peace and stability in the British Empire. So for the sake of peace and stability in the British Empire, it was important not to interfere. And this is what known as laissez-faireism. Leave Indian society alone. Don't interfere in the Indian society so that any intervention of the sort, like Sati um, reform, would actually produce uh, major instability. Sir, I suppose less affair has a wider meaning. So, of course. So is it limited to social question or does it have an economic impact as well? Of course. I mean, less affairism also has a certain impact on economic policy as well. Less affairism, to start with, was not concerned with social policy. Laissez-faireism, as it was enunciated in the doctrines of Adam Smith, Wealth of the Nations in 1776, actually excluded possibilities of state intervention in economy, in business, in uh, economic enterprises. Everything was left with the market forces. And this laissez-faireist logic was invoked by the British during 1813, when in the name of free trade, Indian market was opened for free exploitation by British manufacturers. A huge quantity of textiles began to be imported from that time onwards, leading to the destruction of local industries. This is what is known as deindustrialization. But less affairism was prominent also in the very persistent refusal on the part of the colonial state to protect local industries in the latter half of the 19th century when slowly Indian textile industries were growing in Western India, demanding state protection from foreign competition. It was possible for the British, as some other European countries were doing around this, this time, to impose tariffs, impose duties on imported textiles in order to protect, protect local manufacturers. But the British very systematically and persistently refused 
to accord any measure of protection to local industries until financial problems forced them to concede this in 1917 1918 from then on we know how indian textile managed to capture indian market by shutting out by throwing out lancashire from its prized market in india so if you look at tariff policy which was practiced by the british in the latter half of the century you can see less affairism in economic life but here Soprasachi Bhattacharya, a very distinguished historian of financial policy of the British Empire, wrote a book called The Financial Foundations of the British Raj. Soprasachi Bhattacharya writes about, talks about discriminatory intervention, that it is not wholly less affairist, because uh, the British colonial state invited British investors to invest heavily in Indian railway projects, for which they had to pay interest and the British colonial state stood as a guarantor of a minimum interest of 5% to these British investors. So they were ensuring that even if these railway investors or the railway companies failed or didn't function efficiently, the state stood as a guarantor of a minimum profit. So it is not less affairist. It is not actually leaving everything to the market forces or to the business firm. The state was actually trying to protect British interest. And that is where you can see the real import of policy making. The British were concerned about the stability of the empire. The British were concerned about the protection of British interest. Less affairism was practiced in order to stabilize the, the, the empire. And that is the less affairism in social matters. Less affairism was practiced in the economic matters, in economic sphere, because less affairism suited the British financial and manufacturing interest who had a stranglehold over the Indian economy. So to sum up this entire discussion, we have to recognize that whether you talk about utilitarianism, you talk about orientalism, you talk about paternalism, different kinds of ideas inspiring officials to adopt different kinds of policies. In the end, policies are made in terms of exigencies. Policies are made in response to the problems that the bureaucrats were called upon to solve. And in this particular case, the bureaucrats who represented an alien society who constituted a white ruling class had to maintain stability in an empire where they didn't have a natural affinity. That is the reason why Kipling had to say that they were a half devil, half child. And so the sullen people needed the administrative rod wielded by the civilians. And this particular ideology, however strong it might have been in the official mind, began to disintegrate from the 1920s and 30s when there was a challenge against British rule, with the result that very few Englishmen were now attracted to an Indian service. But when nationalism gathered strength from 1920s onwards, paternalism failed to inspire British officials or the Englishmen to come to India and serve Indian Empire. There was a manpower crisis from 1930s onwards when Indians began to be recruited in larger number in the Indian civil service. So that was the end of paternalism.